sum it up i was able to finish it squeeze everything not everything i wanted to get in but within the time frame that we have i was able to finish it today so today we're going to be talking about the benefits of receiving the holy spirit the consequences of receiving the holy spirit which there are a lot of good consequences but we're going to be speaking of four today just four and there's a lot but we're just going to be speaking of four today but like I, what i like to do always i like to do a quick recap of what we learned the week prior just to kind of keep us in line with what we've already learned so last week, we learned that the Holy Spirit's a convictor. God sends the Holy Spirit to the world to convict the world of their sin through the gospel. And that when a person becomes born again, when a person believes the gospel, this is all the work of God from beginning to end. And this morning, so that's, that's it in a nutshell. That's, we, we expounded upon that last week, but that's really what we learned last week. So with that said, this morning, we're going to be covering the topic of the benefits of receiving the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't know about you, but when I was a child, I always loved it when my when my parents would take me to Walmart and I just to get a toy, a fret, like be at home watching television, and I'd see this toy on TV. Hey, mom. Hey, dad. Uh, look over here. You know what I want. <laughs> anyway, when I was good, or it was a birthday present, early Christmas present, whatever it was, they take me to Walmart and. I was thrilled because I knew I didn't have to pay for it. So I would get to Walmart, I would grab the toy, and then I'd go home, all while all without realizing that the toy said batteries sold separately. Batteries were not included. So I really wasn't a happy camper when I found that out. So why do I mention this? So when you and I believe the gospel, when you and I believe the gospel, we receive the Holy Spirit, but that's not all that happens. Unlike the toys, I'm sure, I'm sure that you bought something and have not realized that you had to buy batteries, right? I'm sure that's happened to at least. Maybe I'm the unlucky one here. But unlike the toys or any other device we've received whose batteries were regrettably not included, when we receive the Holy Spirit, God assures us with 100% certainty that we get all the batteries. So in other words, what I'm trying to say is that when we receive the Holy Spirit, when we believe the gospel and we receive the Holy Spirit, we receive the whole package. There's not a thing that was supposed to come into the life of a new believer that was attached to the Holy Spirit that we did not receive. And when it comes to the things that a person receives, of course, that's what we're going to talk about. What does the person receive? When they believe the gospel, when they receive the Holy Spirit, what happens to that person? So we're, four things happen. Number one, you turn to Ephesians chapter one, verse 13 to 14. Upon receiving the Holy Spirit, each and every one of us receive a sealing. Not, that's S-E-A-L-I-N-G from God which is the believer's guarantee. There's no question of his or her salvation. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 to 14 reads this way. In him, that's in Christ, in Jesus, you also, having listening, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession, to the praise of his glory. That's a powerful scripture. Now notice that the sealing of the Holy Spirit, within these two verses, the sealing of the Holy Spirit, that is the securing of the Holy Spirit. You could use, you know, I like synonyms. 
You can replace the sealing for securing. The securing of the Holy Spirit within the believer is directly tied to the moment a person believes the gospel. So, so you could you could put it like this. So it starts you hear plus believe. No, that's a terrible E. And then it equals the sealing of the Holy Spirit. Is that is that pretty simple? So you hear the gospel, you believe it, what happens? You immediately get sealed with the Holy Spirit. Immediately. The Apostle Paul is crystal clear in Ephesus. I want to make that clear. I want to make it clear that the Apostle Paul is clear. He tells them after they heard the gospel, they believed it. And what was the result? They received the sealing of the Holy Spirit. The very presence of the Holy Spirit, it's important to realize this too, is the security, the guarantee of their eternal salvation. Now, we may be able to mess up a lot of things in our life. We may be able to mess up a lot of plans that we make. But one thing we're not going to mess up is what God does. God seals you with the Holy Spirit. There's no redos. There's no give backs. There's no, there's no do-overs. When you're in the family of God, you're in the family of God, period. No questions asked. You're eternally secure because God has given you his Holy Spirit, as the scripture says, as the very pledge of our inheritance. So if you're, if you're ever having a rough day, which I know you will, don't, don't say you won't. Don't tell yourself you won't. Next time you're having a rough day, let that truth abide in your heart that there's not enough trial in your life and tribulation in your life that can separate you from the love of God. I know I say that a lot, but we all got a lot going on in life. We all got a lot of things that we would rather not going on. Or we would rather not have going on. Let the truth that the Holy Spirit, that you are sealed with the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption rest within your heart. So that's number one. Number two, upon receiving the Holy Spirit, we receive a new nature. We receive a new nature. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. That's this next scripture. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things have passed away, but new, behold, new things have come. Now, now, when we read that, you may be asking yourself, now what in the world does that have to do with receiving the Holy Spirit? It has a lot to do with receiving the Holy Spirit. Because in Romans chapter 8, verse 9, you can hear me read it, turn to it. We'll come back to 2 Corinthians. Romans chapter 8, verse 9, the Apostle Paul says this, But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, you do not belong to Christ. Before a person can belong to Christ, he or she must have the Holy Spirit, period. And as we saw in Ephesians 1.13, how does a person receive the Spirit? They believe. And after they believe, they receive the Holy Spirit. So back to 2 Corinthians 5.17 now. I know I'm talking a little fast, but once a person receives the Holy Spirit, they become a new creature. So to add to this sequence we have, so here plus believe equals ceiling. That equals new creature. So, uh, my apologies for my handwriting. Pretty pathetic. So you have here, believe, you receive the ceiling, and you become a new creature. That's what happens when you receive the Holy Spirit. Now, what in the world does that mean? What does it mean to be a new creature? Does, and what does it mean specifically? Paul uses some strong words. He says the old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. Does this mean a Christian will never sin again? Of course not. First John chapter 2, verse 1 to 2 states otherwise. Does this mean that Christians never have a serious, sinful, habitual struggle with sin? Absolutely not. If you read Romans chapter 7 and 1 Corinthians 3, you just examine the Corinthian church. You'll realize, whew, these are some messed up folks. The fact of the matter is, as you all know, we will all wrestle with some kind of sin uniquely in our own life until we enter the day, until we enter eternity. However, even though that may be the case, the scriptures are clear. The scriptures state that those who are in Christ 
are a new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, the new things have come. So in other words, a believer's position before God has gone from guilty to justified. They've gone from unforgiven to forgiven. They've gone from having the wrath of God upon them, hanging over their heads, to having peace with God through their Lord Jesus Christ. And in addition to this, in addition to this, there is indeed a work that God does within the hearts of believers. And theologian, you've heard me speak of him before, Charles Ryrie, theologian Charles Ryrie, concerning this verse, had this to say. He said, the grace of God not only justifies, but also makes a new creation, which results in a changed lifestyle. The grace of God not only justifies, but also makes a, a new creation, which results in a changed lifestyle. Now, for clarity again, for clarity, I want to repeat myself. But this doesn't mean that Christians no longer struggle with sin. That'd be absurd to teach something like that or believe something like that. When you read the scripture, you see Christians struggle with sin all over the pages of scripture. That's why Paul had to write to a lot of them to say, hey, you're doing this wrong. You're not supposed to do it that way. Here's how you do it. But the normative response, the normative response to the gospel is a changed life. To love Jesus, to keep his commandments, and, and to be his disciple. I'll tell you, when you think, okay, what in the world are Jesus' commandments? We're not talking about the Mosaic law here. Love God and love people. Now, that may sound like, oh, that's not, that's, that's not that much. That's a very hard thing to do. Let's be honest. To love God perfectly, not perfectly, but close to perfect every single day and to love your neighbor as yourself, love your enemies, like that's a hard thing to do. That's a hard thing to do. But God is not simply in the business of justifying people and then not caring about how they live their lives. That's quite the opposite, as you know. God is in the business of both justifying us and giving us a new heart, changing our lives, changing our desires, the way we live. Now, everyone understand that? That's pretty. I, I think of that acronym. Gary, keep it simple, stupid. Kiss acronym. Keep it simple, stupid. I'm trying to do that. Okay, so number three, we receive the forgiveness of sins. This is going to be a quick one. Keep it simple, stupid. Acts chapter 10, verse 43. Acts chapter 10, verse 43 says, Of him, that is of Jesus, all the prophets bear witness that through his name, everyone who believes in him might receive forgiveness. No, that doesn't say that. Says everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sin. So we can add to our nice little sequence over here. And then forgiveness. Yeah, forgiven. I'll just put it in right. You receive forgiveness of sin. So you hear, you believe, you're sealed with the spirit, you become a new creature, and you're forgiven completely. No questions asked. Completely. That was a quick one, right? That's all I'm adding to that. That's what happens. And then the, the last one I want to speak of, number four. When you receive the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit gives you a gift. I know I've been talking about this for a couple of months, but it's so important. When you receive the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit gives you a unique gift. You're not just saved to be saved, and you're not just saved so you can enter into heaven. There's so much more that God has for us. He wants us to live an abundant life. He wants us to have joy in this life. He wants to bless us in this life. Doesn't mean you'll get health, wealth, and prosperity. Not at all. But he wants us to do something with the gifts that he's given us in the spirit. The unfortunate truth is that Christians all over the world today are meeting. They're meeting with each other this morning. But yet once they walk out of their church doors, they won't even contact each other. Until next week. They won't say a single word to each other until next week. Some won't even come back next week. The problem with this kind of thinking and behavior is that when you read the, the first century church, when you read about the first century church in Scripture, you don't see that at all. In fact, Acts chapter 2, verse 46 to 47, you will read the following about the church. Day by day, not week by week, day by day. Continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, 
They were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. These Christians met every day. They met every single day. How would everyone like to do that? Meeting every day. Not necessarily at this in this building. These Christians met in each other's homes. You and I both know that many modern day Christians today would have a hard time doing that. They would have a very hard time. And let alone, I mean, many Christians just have a hard time meeting with the church regularly. The church, it's bothered me for the past couple of years. I've noticed that when you talk to an unbeliever about Jesus, when you talk to an unbeliever about God, what do they say? I don't, I go to church. It ain't about that. And it's, the problem is they have a false idea of what church is. You don't, we don't stop being the church when we leave here. We are the church. This, this is a building we dedicate to God and we give to God to worship him in, to encourage him in. But we are the church. And when, when we call a building a church, we give it a false, a false view that this is like some organization type business title to an unbeliever. That's kind of what it comes off as. But we are the church. That's so important to make that distinction. Um, I know I'm only one man and I can't change the way we talk about church because, you know, I, I tried to tell Maya, we're not going to church. We're meeting with the church. We're not going. And that may seem petty to some people, but it really does affect how you view the church, how you view the people of God, because that is what the church is, the people of God. And another unfortunate truth is that rather than Christians coming together to edify one another, if you, you have time today, read 1 Corinthians 14. Paul gives the Corinthian church a set of instructions on how to encourage one another. But 1 Corinthians 14, 26, Paul will say, whatever you do, let it be for the edification of one another. Everything I say right now is supposed to be for your edification. It's supposed to be for my edification. It's, it's not to be for show. It's not to be, hey, he's the preacher. He's got to talk. No, I'm, I'm to edify you. That's why, the, that's why the church is to gather together, is to edify one another with our own unique gifts that the Holy Spirit has given us. But many Christians go to church to be served rather than to serve. Many Christians go to church to be served rather than to serve. And I'm not just talking about meeting on a building and meeting in a building on Sunday. This is throughout the week too. You know, um, don't be that kind of Christian. Don't let yourself be that kind of Christian. You have a choice today. As Joshua said, choose who you'll serve today. Don't, don't let yourself be that type of Christian. In 1 Corinthians, not 1 Corinthians, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10, it's clear. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10, Peter says, As each one has received a special gift. Talking to you. Talking to me. Employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Peter's encouraging each and every one of us to use our gifts for the edification of one another. And then 1 Corinthians 12, 5 to 13, Paul says, And there are a variety of ministries, but the same Lord. There are a variety of effects, but the same God who works all things in person, in all persons. But to each one, each Christian, Paul's talking about, is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. So whatever you're given, the gifts that you're given, is to be for your common good. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, and to another the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, and to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, and to another the effecting of miracles, and to another prophecy, to another distinguishing of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of tongues. But one in the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually just as he wills. Remember, the Holy Spirit has a will. He's a person. He is God, the Spirit of God. Trinity, three persons in one. We kind of discussed that the first, the first uh, lesson we had. 
but it continues for even as the body is one yet has many members and all the bot and all the members of the body though they are many they are one body so also is christ for by one spirit we were all baptized into one body whether jews or greeks whether slaves or free and we are all made to drink of one spirit i know that's a lot the point is there's a lot of gifts and all of us have one or multiple gifts. And the word of God is clear. The spirit has given us gifts to be used for the edification and the common good of one another. Now, I know I say that, and many of us will go home, and it will be fresh on our mind today, maybe the next two three days, and then kind of fade away. Kind of fade away. Next week will come. Next week will come. Let's face it, we'll get we'll get a little burnout. That's just what's going to happen. If you're always on a spiritual high, I want to be your best friend because I want to know how you're doing that. It's important to dive yourself into the Word of God. I could, there's more we could say about the filling of the Spirit, the dwelling of the Spirit. <laughs> I mean, you can just go on and on. If you want to be filled with the Spirit, Ephesians 5.19, Paul says, "Be fill, do not be drunk with wine for that's dissipation, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. You have the dwelling of the Holy Spirit as a Christian, but you need the filling of the Holy Spirit. Ways you can do that, he answers that in Ephesians 5.19, sing psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. Dive yourself into the word. I don't know about you, but when, I, when I'm in the scriptures, I have such a better, more of a better day than when I'm not. I'm more, I'm stronger in the spirit because I'm, the, the spirit sharpens my mind. I'm able to focus on what God wants rather than just waking up every day trying to remember what I learned Sunday, trying to remember what I learned Wednesday. Uh, so last scripture, this is my conclusion. Last scripture, 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. That's good news. Is, you know, you may wake up and you may say, God, I know you want me to do this. I know you want me to behave this way. I know I'm saved. I know I'm, I know I'm, when I die, I'm, I'm going to heaven. I'm going to be in your presence. But I'm not dead yet. I'm still here. And I'm still dealing with stuff I don't want to deal with. And I'm just waking up cranky today, having a bad day. The Lord says that he will reward us. For our work, our work that we do for God is not in vain. In Hebrews, we're told that the Lord is a rewarder of those who seek him and that he will not forget the things that we do for him. So my encouragement to you and more importantly, the Holy Spirit's encouragement to you. Take advantage of the gifts that you have. And run until run the race until your last dying breath. Go strong. Exit. This world going strong. Nowadays, you got social media. If you're afraid to tell someone about Jesus in person, type in some random name, Daniel. I don't know. Find Daniel. Find a guy who, huh, you, you think, I don't know, just send anyone the gospel through social media. What are they going to do? Cuss you out? Say, say some bad things to you? Okay. That's, that's just a common thing that happens to Christians a lot. I'm just saying there's easy ways to serve the Lord. It's not like you have to travel across the country. You don't have to become a preacher. You don't have to become a pastor. You, you, you don't have to do these big things. Showing love to people, holding the door open for people, giving gifts out. We're going to talk about this at the church service. Um, you know, reaching out to the community in, in little ways. The Lord will reward you for that, and he promises you that. So that concludes our three little Three week little series of the Holy Spirit. I hope that's been beneficial to you. I know it is to me. There's so much we can dive into when it comes to the Holy Spirit. But so for those who would like to stay, uh, church services, we'll be having a meeting about what we're going to do this month, reaching out to the community. And uh, so, yeah, that's pretty much said and done. If you'd like to join us Wednesday night for Bible study, we're in John chapter 10. It's been a really good study. Uh, I'm really appreciating it and really liking it. It's uh, you know, it's again, it's a feeling of the Holy Spirit. 
you, you fill yourself with the word of God and, you know, you're able to combat Satan and temptation and sin a whole lot better when you do that. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for bringing us together today. We thank you for the Holy Spirit. Help us to not forget the things that we learn. The Holy Spirit dwells in us. We believe, we receive the Holy Spirit. We receive a sealing of the Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our salvation. We receive the forgiveness of sins when we place our faith in Christ. And we are a new creation. We have a new purpose in life. We have a new heart. Help us to walk in step with the Spirit. Help us to not be disobedient people. Help us to love you and to keep you first in all of our thoughts and decisions in life. Uh, we, we sung a song today that said, we know who holds tomorrow. We don't know what awaits us tomorrow. We don't know what awaits this country in the next uh, few generations to come. We just pray that your hand will be over it and that, uh, that, and that those who get in leadership of uh, this nation, that you'll you'll – your hand will be on them. Help us to never forget that you're sovereign. You're in control of everything. When things seem to be chaotic and out of our hand, it's not chaotic and out of your hand, though. Uh, help us to have a faith that is strong in you. It's in Jesus we pray.